This Parsha podcast is sponsored by Beth Pop in loving memory and Le'ilu Nishmas, her father, Chana Moshe ben Shlomo Halevi, may his soul ascend in heaven. Parsha's Va'era has 121 verses, and it begins the process of extricating the Jewish people from Egypt. We're going to read about 10 miraculous plagues that the Almighty is going to foist upon the Egyptians. And in this week's Parsha, we're going to read the first seven of the 10 plagues. And last week's parsha, the Almighty was convincing Moses, Moshe, to go save the Jewish people. And his first attempt to secure the nation's freedom was an absolute disaster. Instead of the burden of the slavery of the servitude being eased, it was deepened, it was stiffened. He comes back to God. He tells God, why did you make it bad for the nation? And the Almighty is going to respond in the beginning of this week's Parsha. And the Almighty is going to levy quite a harsh criticism against Moses by telling him that Moses, by Moshe, you are not as righteous as your forebearers, as Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Parsha begins, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Hashem. I appeared to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob as Kel Shakai, the name of God. But with my name Hashem, I did not make myself known to them. Furthermore, I established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their sojourning in which they have sojourned. Moreover, I've heard the groan of the children of Israel, whom Egypt enslaves, and I remembered my covenant. Therefore, go tell the Jewish people, I am Hashem, I'm going to take them out of Egypt. I'm going to redeem them. I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to take them out, and they're going to be for me as a people, and I'm going to be for them as a God. So Rashi has two different explanations to understand exactly what this original message is and the contrast that the Almighty is presenting here between Moses and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His favorite explanation deals with the fact that the Torah gives us many different names of God. In fact, if you count the names of God given to us in the Torah, there are 10 different names of God. God, and of course this is not to mean that there's different deities, rather each one of them refers to a different mode of relationship. In fact, there's large swaths of the Kabbalah, of the Jewish mysticism, that orients around the question of understanding the names of God, and exactly what do they represent. And what he's telling Moses is that when he appeared, when God appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it was with the name Kel Shakai. Now, of course, a quick note, we do amend the name if we're speaking about it and not reading it from the Torah. So I appeared to Abraham and Jacob with Kel Shakai, which is one of the names of God. And that is the name that is used when the Almighty is giving a promise, but not, in fact, delivering yet upon that promise. Whereas to you, I appeared with a different name, and that is indicating that I'm going to fulfill my promises to you And nevertheless, despite the fact that my revelation to you was greater than my revelation to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are still questioning me. You're still not believing, so to speak. You are resisting the message and you're questioning why did you do it to the Jewish people. And Rashi goes on to show how three times in Genesis, when the Almighty promised the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he appeared to each one of them with the name, using the name Kel Shakai, and that, in fact, is evidence of the fact that he promised, he pledged, he gave an oath, but he did not quite deliver on that promise. Now, the Ramban has a slight different way of reading it. He explains that the Almighty appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the patriarchs, with the attribute of judgment. He treated them with harshness, whereas to Moses, he's going to treat, or he has been treating him with mercy. Now, it's interesting, when the Almighty describes what he's going to do, the Talmud notes that he uses four different words to describe the Exodus. Go tell the Jewish people, I am Hashem. I shall take them out from the burdens of Egypt. I shall rescue you from their service. I shall redeem you. And I shall take you to me as a people. And the Talmud tells us, why do we drink four cups of wine every Passover night? The night that we remember, the night that we herald the Exodus, we drink four cups of wine to evoke the four specific words of redemption that the Almighty uses to describe the pending Exodus. 
Now, the commentaries add that there is a fifth term used to describe the Yetzirah. I shall bring you to the land about which I raised my hand. And that is why we have the fifth cup, the cup of Elijah, because that word has not yet been fully fulfilled and is going to be done at the hands of Messiah. And Elijah is going to herald the arrival of Messiah. Therefore, we have the fifth cup for the fifth term to evoke this element of the redemption that we are still waiting for. So Moshe has been encouraged by God. He's been told, okay, give this message. It's still going to happen. He goes to reach out to the Jewish people and they don't listen to them. So Moses spoke according to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of shortness of breath and hard work. They are at a state of total exasperation. They're so consumed. They're so inundated with work that they don't even have the time and the bill and the possibility to listen, to think properly, to process, to contemplate. They can't even hear words of redemption. And this is a sad, sorry state of affairs. The Jewish people, they have Moses. Moses has proven himself to be a legitimate prophet coming from God, promising redemption, and they're suffering so badly. They're inundated with work so intensely that they cannot even hear words of hope, words of redemption. Hashem's what the Moses is saying comes to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and send the children of Israel from his land. So after Moses conveyed this message, even though it wasn't accepted, now the Almighty instructs Moses to go speak to Pharaoh to extract the people from the land. And Moses objects again. He says, after all, the children of Israel, the people I'm coming ostensibly to save, they have not listened to me. So how's Pharaoh going to listen to me? After all, I have sealed lips. And this is the second time we've seen that, that Moses has a speech impediment. He doesn't speak as clearly, as fluidly. And therefore, the people of Israel, who God tells Moses, you're going to save, they don't listen to Moses. Certainly, Pharaoh's not going to listen to Moses. And Moses doesn't have the ability to persuade, the ability to influence. After all, his lips are sealed. So the Almighty responds, Hashem spoke to Moses and Aaron and commanded them regarding the children of Israel and regarding Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to take the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So if you read these verses, verse 12 and verse 13, without the commentary of Rashi, you don't really understand what the dialogue is. Moses says, how can I go to Pharaoh? After all, the Jews don't listen to me. Certainly Pharaoh won't listen to me. I have sealed lips. I am not exactly articulate. And the Almighty responds to him, and to Aaron, just go speak to Pharaoh to take the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So Rashi illuminates this exchange and provides us a deep insight. If you analyze the objections of Moses, you'll find that there were three particular objections. Number one, the children of Israel won't listen to me. Number two, Pharaoh won't listen to me. And number three, I have heavy lips, I have sealed lips, I have the speech impediment. Says Rashi, what the Almighty is instructing him in verse 13 are three answers to the three objections. Number one, what do you do with the Jewish people? You have to treat them with pleasantness. You have to suffer. You have to bear the burden of the Jewish people. Yes, they're not listening to you, but you know what? Become a greater leader. What does it mean to be a greater leader? It means to be a leader that has more empathy, that has more care, that has more patience, that has more tolerance of their constituents, and that will encourage the Jewish people to, yes, listen to you. Problem one, solution one. Problem two, Pharaoh will listen to me? Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, says God in verse 13. Give him honor. Everyone, especially kings, likes and even needs honor. There is a way to persuade Pharaoh. Give him honor. Dispense him honor. Make him feel like he's all-powerful, and then you will have his ear too. As to the third problem, that you have a speech impediment, I'm going to give you Aaron. Aaron is going to be your spokesman. Aaron's going to join your team. And indeed, he will be your mouthpiece and you'll be able to sidestep the third problem of having heavy lips. And I think that maybe this is a lesson for us. Sometimes we have to figure solutions to our problems using whatever tools we already have. And sometimes we have to bring in some outside personnel because the people on board cannot solve, cannot resolve the problem. We have to add Aaron to the team. Now, the Ramban asks the question, 
wait a minute, wasn't Aaron added in last Parsha? Didn't we have the exact same exchange during the first time where Moses objects and God says, okay, Aaron will come and he will be your partner. He's going to speak. You speak to him and he'll speak to Pharaoh. So Rabban explains that Aaron was there for the initial meeting, but because the initial meeting was a failure, he had to be renominated. And now once again, he is back on board. It's not so clear to me from reading the Ramban as to exactly why this happened in this fashion. Okay, so Moses and Aaron are about to go speak to Pharaoh, but in the interim, we have the pedigree of Moshe and Aaron, and it begins with the children of Israel. So there's an intermission in the story, and it talks about the children of Israel, the children of Reuven, Reuben, his sons, the sons of Shimon, these are the two oldest sons of Jacob. And then we talk about the sons, the grandsons, and the great-grandsons of Levi, and of course the two great-grandsons of Levi that are the main subjects of the story are Moses and Aaron. Now Rashi tells us that we are given the length of the life of Levi. He lived 137 years. Why is it important for us to be told the amount of years that Levi lived, but we're not told the amount of years that Ruvain or Shimon lived? So Rashi tells us that so long as any one of Joseph's brothers was still alive, the enslavement of the Jewish people had not yet begun. And because Levi had outlived them all, he was the last to pass. Therefore, we could calculate from the age that Levi was when he passed, exactly when the full-fledged enslavement of the Jewish people began. Once it gives us, once it attributes Moses and Aaron back to Levi, it resumes the narrative of what happened once they went to go visit Pharaoh. So the commentaries ask the question, you know, why does it mention Reuben and Shimon if it's all there to attribute the pedigree of Moses and Aaron? Why is there a need to mention Reuben and Shimon? So Rashi gives us one answer and he tells us that at the end of Genesis, Jacob, when he was blessing his sons, he gave admonition to Reuben and Shimon and therefore to balance out the rebuke that they received at the end of last book, at the beginning of this book, they are given some honor and their names, their families are enumerated. The Ramban gives a different answer. He says, don't get the impression that because Levi became the tribe that had amongst its ranks Moses and Aaron, don't get the impression that Levi became the firstborn. He catapulted over Reuben and Shimon. There is still a certain hierarchy. Reuben and Shimon are still older and to assert that the Torah delineated Reuven and Shimon and their children in the description of the pedigree of Moshe and Aaron. Now, the commentaries point out that the sons of Reuven and Shimon are mentioned, but with respect to Levi, it's not just the sons of Levi, it's also the grandsons of Levi. So there's a very interesting Sephorno as to why Levi merited to father Moses and Aaron, and why indeed his grandchildren are mentioned. So he tells us that when the Torah is describing the children, the grandchildren of Jacob, the children of Reuven, the children of Shimon, etc., all the people over here in middle of the description of the Exodus, the reason why is because these were people of exalted stature. That Those are the only people that are being mentioned. And Reuven, he's the firstborn of Israel. He's the oldest son of Jacob. And he had children that were worthy of maintaining that stature. But by the time he got to his grandchildren, they really didn't have that quite that same stature. And therefore, they are not eligible for this list. Similarly, Shimon, his children were fitting to be included in this list. His grandchildren, not. But Levi, he was someone who lived a long life. And therefore, he had the opportunity to rear more of his descendants. And therefore, it wasn't only his sons that were influenced by Levi. It was his grandsons too. And therefore, they are worthy of a slot over here in this discussion amongst this list of very special people that are counted in the middle of the description of 
Exodus. In fact, Rabbeinu B'chaya, he enumerates six different prophets from the bunch of Levites, sons and grandsons of Levi. Now, I found it interesting that Moses, we know he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Yet the Sephora tells us that the reason why Levi married it to such great children that he had children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren like Aaron, like Moses, like Miriam, it's because he lived longer, was able to influence them for longer. But how would that extend to Moses? After all, wasn't Moses raised not by his family, but by his stepmother, the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh? Maybe we could suggest an answer. And this is a deep pedagogical insight. We know that Moses' biological mother reared him for the first couple of years of his life until he was weaned. Maybe what the Sepharno is indicating is that the first few years of life, these are not years that don't really matter. Only once the kid matures can a parent influence them. Quite the contrary. At this time, when the child is developing, they're sprouting, they're maturing, that's the time when all the critical lessons are imparted, and that's the time when the direction of the child's life is determined. Now, it is also interesting Moses' father and mother were related. His father Amram married his aunt, Yocheved. And the commentaries note that once the Torah was given at Sinai, that relationship was banned. And in fact, if a person were to marry his aunt, they would bear children from that forbidden union. That child would be rendered a mamzer, someone who is ineligible to join the Jewish people. And isn't it interesting that Moses, the greatest leader of all time, the greatest leader of Jewish people, the one who gave us the Torah, he is someone that really it's only a loophole that makes him not illegitimate. Had he been born several years later after Sinai, after the Torah is given to the Jewish people, his parents would be a forbidden union to the degree that their children would be ineligible. Now, technically, he's okay. But this is another example of us, the nation, and the Almighty directing the nation to choose flawed leaders, or at least leaders that have some pretty hefty skeletons in their closet. And the Talmud tells us, you don't appoint a king of the Jewish people, a leader of the Jewish people, unless they have something that is somewhat shameful in their origin story, because otherwise they could lord over their subjects, and they won't be good kings. A few other interesting Rashi's here. When it talks about the wife of Aaron, it indicates that she was the sister of Nachshon. Rashi tells us, quoting from the Talmud of Book of Yivamos, that when someone gets married, it's important for them to inspect the brothers of their prospective bride because most sons are similar to the brothers of the spouse. And therefore, when Aaron was seeking a wife, he was looking at the brothers of of the prospective wife, and he found the sister of Nachshon. Nachshon's going to be a hero later on in the Torah. She indeed was worthy, not just because of her, of her own righteousness, but because of the fact that her brother was righteous too. There's another interesting Rashi. After it finishes attributing the pedigree of Moses and Aaron, it tells us, this is Moses and Aaron, this is Aaron and Moses. And Rashi tells us the fact that it switches it from Aaron to Moses, Moses to Aaron, that's to indicate that they were equal. Aaron, Moses, Moses, Aaron, we don't need to choose which one goes first. Sometimes we can have Aaron first, sometimes we can have Moses first because truthfully they are equal. And the obvious question is, we know that Moses is considered the greatest person, the greatest human, the greatest Jew of all time. In fact, the Torah states quite clearly that there's never going to be a prophet akin to Moses, how can Rashi, quoting from our sages, tell us that Moses and Aaron are one and one A, they are equal? So there's several answers to this question. I think one answer is that, yes, of course, Moses was greater than Aaron, but they didn't think about that because, after all, they were working like a team, like we saw last week. Moses and Aaron, each one of them wanted the other one to have the glory. Moses wanted to deflect his honor to give it to Aaron. Aaron wanted to give it back to Moses. When brothers are working as a team, 
they're considered one, even though one of them is higher than the other. That's just technical. They're working together. They're unified as one. A second answer I saw in the commentaries, and that is that it's not about the absolute level of achievement that a person gets that determines their stature. You know, if one person was capable of 100 units of greatness and they got, let's say, 90, so they achieved 90% of what the Almighty expected from them. Whereas if you have another person who is given a 1,000 units of potential success, they do 300. So in absolute terms, they've done 210 more units of achievement than the other person. But they're considered a failure because they only achieved 30% of their potential. Moses and Aaron were equal. In absolute terms, Moses was much greater. But in relative terms, each one of them maximized their potential. Each one achieved exactly what the Almighty set out for them, and therefore, in the Almighty's eyes, so to speak, in his lenses of judgment, when it's not a question of absolutes, but rather a question of, did you do what the Almighty wanted you to do? They are indeed equal. There's a famous teacher in the Rambam in the Laws of Repentance where he tells us that every person in the world could be as great as Moses. Of course, you and I and anyone that we know cannot become like Moses because we cannot become even the lowest level of prophet, certainly not the highest level of prophet. But what this means is, despite the fact that we are given less potential, less opportunity to become great, if we do 100% of what we can do, By definition, we are as great as Moses in relative terms and in the Almighty's eyes. After all, if we check all the boxes, if we do everything we can, we are a unbridled success. Chapter 7 begins with the Almighty instructing Moses that he's going to be a master of a pharaoh. His brother Aaron's going to be his spokesman. And you tell Pharaoh everything I tell you, but I am going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And as a result, I'm going to facilitate a multiplicity of miracles, of signs, of wonders in the land of Egypt before the ultimate exodus. Now, this idea is one of the central questions of the parasha, the idea of Pharaoh's heart being hardened. Our heart is our capacity to be impacted. If someone has a sealed up heart, they're not going to be impressionable, they're not going to be receptive to rebuke, and they're not going to be receptive to changing their ways. Pharaoh's heart is going to be hardened, God tells us. He is going to be unreceptive to change and thus, to a certain degree, incapable of free will. Now, it's important to stress that as we read the Parsha, we'll find, we'll discover that Pharaoh himself is going to harden his own heart. And there's many, many examples of Pharaoh himself without any godly divine intervention, Pharaoh himself resisting and closing up his own heart resisting the miracles and resisting the logical and prophetic call to release the Jewish people. When Moses is going to do miracles, Pharaoh is going to say, "Heh, I could do that myself. And he's going to call over his sorcerers and his necromancers and his gurus to do the same. And he is going to refuse to accede that Moses is real, his prophecy is real, what he's saying is real even after his sorcerers admit that they cannot replicate what Moses and Aaron are doing and thus indicating that it is the hand of God, the finger of God, that is powering this movement and these plagues. Pharaoh's heart is going to be hardened in our Parsha. The Almighty is going to interfere with Pharaoh's free will, but that's only going to happen from the fifth plague and on. Nevertheless. It's still a major discussion in all the commentaries. There's a very famous Rambam on this subject. How is it fair that Pharaoh was withheld from repentance? How is it fair that the Almighty withdrew from Pharaoh the ability to have free will? How is it fair that Pharaoh's heart was hardened? So the Ramban here, he has two explanations to explain how this is not injustice. After all, if the Almighty hardens his heart, How can he be held accountable? How can he be punished? And his first answer, and this is in fact the same answer that the Rambam gives, that because Pharaoh is not joining the story now, he's had a preponderance of sin, terrible sins, horrific sins, up to this point. A consequence of certain sins 
is a punishment of losing free will. That's an idea that the Ram says, that if someone is so bad, so corrupt, so sinful, part of what can happen to them is that they lose their free will. A second answer that the Ramban gives is that even after Pharaoh's heart was hardened, it's not because he wanted to repent and they might have said no. Rather, he wanted to simply stop the pain, to avoid the punishment, to avoid the plagues. And therefore, what the Ramban tells us is that there's no fundamental philosophical problem with the Almighty not allowing Pharaoh to unburden himself from his pain. The problem is only if Pharaoh wants to repent and the Almighty says no, well, that seems to be a problem for us philosophically. But if Pharaoh never really considers repenting, it's not really a problem for the Almighty to harden his heart because after all, the Almighty decided that he should be punished, he should be caused pain, he should be given these plagues for a constructive purpose and therefore, even if he doesn't want it, he wants to avoid the pain, it doesn't matter. The Almighty is going to harden his heart. Now, Rashi adds a critical aspect to this answer, and he explains that to what that benefit is. What is the point of continuously hardening Pharaoh's heart if he wants to send the Jewish people? It, well, isn't that the goal? Isn't the goal to send the Jewish people out? And if Pharaoh accedes to it after the fifth plague, why is there a need to continuously harden his heart, to force his hand, to bear more of these plagues, he wants to let them go. Okay, we've achieved our goal, let's leave. So Rashi tells us that this is not about the Egyptians. The reason why we have the plagues, it's not to facilitate the Exodus. The Almighty is doing miracles. He could extract the Jewish people from Egypt with a miracle. And in fact, spoiler alert, in actually's parish when the Jewish people are leaving, it's also miraculous. So the Almighty could have dispensed with all the earlier miracles, just through the miracles of the Exodus, and the Jewish people are out. No, tells us Rashi. The reason why the Almighty is doing these plagues is for the Jewish people, that they should develop their sense of faith. They should see how the Almighty is in total control over everything. All the levers of power are in God's hand. After all, this nation has been living in Egypt surrounded by idolatry, surrounded by paganism, for 210 years. And in fact, Talmud tells us that many of the Jewish people, sadly, did descend into the ways of idolatry of their Egyptian neighbors. In order for them to leave, in order for them to become God's people, they have to see that their previous overlords, the Egyptians, are not real powers. They are pretend paper tigers. They are, in fact, subject to the Almighty God. And therefore, the Almighty is going to suppress and to punish and to oppress and to cause these painful plagues to the Egyptians, not because the Egyptians need to be punished, but rather to show his complete dominion over all, all and everything, his complete hegemony over everything to the Jewish people and shift in the minds of the Jewish people. Who is in charge? from the idols, from the Egyptians, now they know that it's only God who is the one who has all the powers, and that's going to craft the mindset needed for the Jewish people to become an independent people, a people subject to God, a people subservient to God, a people worthy of Torah, and worthy of being the ultimate nation that Abraham started many years prior. Moses and Aaron did as Hashem commanded them, so they did. Moses was 80 years old. Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Why do we need to be told their their age? So the Sephardah tells us that despite their advanced age, for the next year or so, that's going to be the duration of time of the plagues, they're going to wake up every day early. They're going to be energetic. They're going to be sprightly in doing the will of God, notwithstanding the fact that they were already of advanced age. Moses is 80 and Aaron is 83. So they made their trip to Pharaoh once again. And when they arrive, the Almighty tells them, take your staff, throw it onto the ground. It's going to become a snake. So Moses and Aaron, they come to Pharaoh and they do this amazing miracle. They take their staff. It's a wooden staff. Chuck it on the floor, throw it on the floor. And in front of the eyes of Pharaoh and in front of the eyes of his servants, it becomes a snake. Is Pharaoh impressed? 
No, he is not. Pharaoh too, some of his wise men and sorcerers, and they too, the necromancers of Egypt, did so with their incantations. Each one of them threw down the staff and became snakes, and the staff of Aaron swallowed their staffs. Moses and Aaron do a miraculous trick. Obviously, it should prove to them, to everyone, that they have God on their sides. The Egyptians say, that's no big deal, we could do the same. You're bringing magic to Egypt. This is the home of magic. And the gurus of Pharaoh do the exact same trick. Now, we know how Moses and Aaron did it. They had God on their side. And God is not subject to the rules of physics. And the staff turned into a serpent. How did the Egyptians pull off that trick? So the Rabban tells us that it was done via some sort of black magic, via destroying angels that can be manipulated if he knows exactly how to do it. The Ibn Ezra, he says, no, it was sleight of hand. This was just simple trickery like a magician would do today. I saw someone theorize that there's apparently a certain snake that if you hold it by its nape of its neck, if you hold it in the right place, it stiffens up and it becomes mobilized and it looks like a staff, looks like a, like a stick. And then when you throw it on the ground, it because after all, it is a regular snake, it turns into a snake because it always was a snake. It was pretending to be a stick when it's being held in that fashion. Regardless, they do the trick, and then it becomes once again a staff, and then the staff of Aaron swallows their staff. Rashi tells us this is a super-duper miracle, a miracle within a miracle, even after all the staffs return to being staffs, return to being regular sticks, Aaron's stick swallows their sticks. Okay, they're not impressed. Let's begin with the first plague, the plague of blood. The Almighty tells Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He's not going to send the Jewish people. Go to him in the morning. He's going to go out to the water, to the Nile. He goes there every morning to bathe. Rashi tells us because he pretended that he was a deity and a deity doesn't need to go to the bathroom. And every morning, of course, he would need to release his bowels, go to the bathroom in the Nile, and therefore this is kind of a way to also demonstrate to him that we know exactly that you're nothing more than an average or regular person. You're not a powerful deity. And the Almighty tells Moses, tell him that the Almighty, God of the Hebrews, sent me, let the people go. They want to serve me in the wilderness. If you don't do it, we're going to strike the waters of the river and they're going to turn into blood. And all the fish that's in the water, is going to die, the river will become disgustingly foul and putrid, and everyone's going to want water, everyone's going to seek water, and they're not going to have any. They convey that warning, it is inefficacious, and indeed, the Almighty tells Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff, stretch it over the waters of Egypt, the rivers, the canals, the reservoirs, over every gathering of water, and it's going to become blood. And indeed, they did it, he held a staff aloft, struck the water in the presence of Pharaoh, in the presence of his servants, and all the water that was in the river changed to blood. And indeed, the fish that were in the river, they died. Why is it to mention that the fish in the river died? The commentators tell us that's to indicate that this is not food coloring, this is not some sort of trick of making the water appear like it was blood. Indeed, it did turn into real blood, so much so that the fish life in the water died. Now, why is Aaron the one to strike the water? Why not Moses himself? And in fact, in the first three plagues, the first two, blood and frauds, the next one, the lice, it is Aaron that's actually doing the activity of hitting either the water in the case of the first two plagues or the land in the case of the third plague. It's Aaron and it's not Moses. So Rashi tells us, going from the Talmud, because Moses, he has to appreciate the Nile. After all, when he was a little kid, he was floating safely upon the Nile. And therefore, to a certain extent, to a certain degree, he is beholden. He must indicate his appreciation to the Nile. It's improper for him to strike the Nile. The commentators here, they uh, share a teaching from the Talmud. The Talmud says, when you drink from a reservoir, from a well, don't throw a rock into that same well. Moses, you benefited from the water, don't strike it. Moses, you benefited from the earth, from the terra firma of Egypt. When you killed the Egyptian in the beginning of the book of Exodus, 
the earth swallowed up the body and covered up the evidence. Therefore, it's improper for you to show your ingratitude towards the earth. Let Aaron hit it, not you. So they do this amazing miracle. All the fish are dying. And once again, Pharaoh comes up with an alternative explanation. He doesn't need God to harden his heart. His heart is hardened by himself. He calls over his necromancers. He calls over his gurus. And they do turn the water into blood. Once again, Pharaoh returns to his home, to his palace, and he does not take this message to heart. For the course of seven days, the Egyptian dug round about the river for water to drink. They could not drink from the waters of the river. After seven days, the Almighty restored the blood back to water. Now, the Talmud tells us a striking illustration of what it was like during that week of, of the first plague, the plague of blood. The Jewish people, wherever they went, there was fresh, clean, delicious water. Whereas the Egyptian would grab that glass, glass of water, it would instantly turn into blood. You have a Jew and Egyptian, each one of them having a straw stuck into the same liquid. For the Jew, it's water. For the Egyptian, it is blood. The Talmud tells us that during the course of these seven days, the Jews became rich from selling water to Egyptians during this plague. If a Jew would have water, give it to the Egyptian, and they would pay for it, indeed it would remain water, and the Jewish people became rich over the course of this week. Chapter 7 concludes with the second plague, the plague of frogs. Hashem said to Moses, Come to Pharaoh and say to him, So said Hashem, send out my people, so let me serve me. If you refuse to send them out, behold, I shall strike your entire boundary with frogs. The river shall swarm with frogs, and they shall ascend and come into your palace, your bedroom, your bed, into the house of your servants, into your ovens, into your kneading bowls, and into you and your people, and all your servants will the frogs ascend. There's a very interesting teaching in the Talmud, the book of Psalm, page 53b, that talks about the frogs going into the ovens. What it tells us is that Hananiah, Mishal, Azariah, these are three sages at the end of the era of prophecy, and they were given a choice to do idolatry or to die in a fire. And they chose to go in the fire, but they might have made a miracle, and they were not injured as a result of being cast into a fiery furnace. Why did they choose to go into the fire? They took a lesson from the suicide mission of these frogs. And they said, after all, the frogs, they don't need to do the will of God. Nevertheless, they jumped in to the ovens. They endangered themselves. They went into the hot oven to fulfill the will of God. Us, we are required in the mitzvos of sanctification of God's name. We are required to do the will of God all the more so we should jump to the fire, and therefore this suicide mission of the fraud to jump in the oven was inspiration for three very righteous Jews more than a thousand years later. Rashi also tells us, interestingly, that the frauds are going to go into you and into your people, meaning they're going to be croaking in their stomach. Of course, Pharaoh does not listen, and indeed... Moses tells Aaron, stretch your hand out, strike the rivers, the waters of Egypt. And indeed, a fraud infestation ascended and covered up the land of Egypt. Rashi tells us, according to one opinion, that there was one mega frog that it would expel hordes of little frogs when they would hit it. So one huge frog came out of the Nile. The Egyptians were freaking out and they would come with their sticks and hit it. Every time they hit it, hordes of frogs would be expelled from this one mega frog. And the commentaries point out that this shows us that sometimes anger is quite irrational and self-destructive. Even though every time they would hit that same frog, it would exacerbate their problem, they wouldn't stop and they would continuously hit it. And it covered all of Egypt. The entire land of Egypt was covered. The commentaries tell us, quoting a Midrash, that this plague actually settled border disputes with neighboring countries because the frogs were all over Egypt and they would demark the boundaries of Egypt and they would not step foot into the neighboring countries. So you could see where the frogs covered and you would know exactly where the correct borders of Egypt were and where was the land of others. 
Pharaoh is not managing. So he summons Moses and Aaron and says, please pray to God. Let him remove this horrific plague of frauds. They're causing such devastation. It's impossible to hear. It's impossible to live. It's impossible to manage. I'm going to send the Jewish people out. Just please, please remove this horrific plague from me. And Moses responds, okay, well, when should I have them removed? And, of course, the best answer to that question is remove the menace immediately. But Pharaoh says no. Pharaoh says, why don't you pray that God removes the frauds tomorrow? So Moses says, okay, I'll have them removed tomorrow. He goes out, he prays, and indeed, the next day, all the frauds died, and they're piled up in heaps, and heaps in the land smells from the putrid stench of mountains of dead frauds. Now, the obvious question is, if Moses is offering to remove the frauds, isn't the correct answer to say, get rid of it now? So the Ramban gives a very interesting answer. He says that Pharaoh, notwithstanding all the miracles that he's already seen, he doesn't believe. He thinks that Moses maybe is a more clever necromancer than all his necromancers, and he knows that there's a certain time, a certain forecast for a large infestation of frauds. And he knows that it's coming to an end right now. And therefore, he's asking me, when should I have it end? With the anticipation, he thinks, Moses thinks, that I'm going to say right now. I'm going to trick him. I'm going to say tomorrow. And then when they leave right now, I'll be able to disprove him. And therefore, he said tomorrow. And of course, Moses was not using any external knowledge He was following the will of God and Pharaoh and his people had suffered for one more day because of Pharaoh's intransigence. So Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh's presence. Moses cried out to Hashem concerning the frauds that he had inflicted upon Pharaoh. Hashem cried out the word of Moses and the frauds died from the houses, from the courtyards, and from the fields. And they piled up heaps and heaps. There's an amazing Kliyakar who points out something very astonishing from these verses. Which frauds died? So it mentions the ones in the houses, the ones in the courtyards, and the ones in the fields. What happened to the ones in the ovens? The only ones that survived, says the Kliyakar, or speculates the Kliyakar, were the ones that were in the ovens. All the other ones, they tried to save their lives, the frauds did, by not going into the danger. And the ones who sacrificed their lives for God, so to speak, They were the ones that actually survived, whereas everyone else, all the other frauds, died. Okay, so that's the second plague, and we go on to the third plague, the plague of lice. Now, the plague of lice happened without warning. In fact, that's a pattern throughout the ten plagues, first two with warning, and the third without any warning. Now, the Ramban, he suggests that the reason why every third one was without warning Because every third one did not carry with it the threat to life. The Almighty tells Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand, strike the dust of the land, and all the dust is going to turn into lice. And that's what they did. Aaron stretched out his hand with a staff, struck the dust of the land, and the lice infestation that was on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice with the land of Egypt. The sorcerers once again tried to replicate it, and they couldn't do it, and they responded to Pharaoh in defeat. This is the finger of God. This is not Moses being the uber-sorcerer, the uber-necromancer. This is, in fact, divine. But Pharaoh's heart was strong, and he did not heed them as Hashem had spoken. Rashi tells us that the forces of the necromancers, the forces of the sorcerers, cannot have any strength, cannot have any control over something that's smaller than the size of a barley. And because each individual louse is so small, that's not something that they can have power over, and therefore they cannot replicate this plague, and consequently have to admit and acknowledge that this is nothing other than the hand of God. I saw one of the commentaries point out something very fascinating. There's three times in Scripture that it references the finger of God by creation of the world, by the Ten Plagues, and by the Ten Commandments, we're told that the Ten Commandments were etched into stone by the finger of God. Now, perhaps we could suggest maybe a subplot to this observation. We know 
that there were 10 utterances that God used to create the world. The strictures of nature, the rigidity of science, the rigidity of physics created in Genesis via God's 10 utterances. And then we have over here 10 nature-suspending plagues that shatters those, so to speak, 10 utterances of Genesis. And finally, we have the Ten Commandments, the giving of the Torah, that that's going to form a new world for the Jewish people. And the idea here is that what's happening on a very deep Kabbalistic level is that the Jewish people, like all people, are subject to the rules of nature. The rules of nature as codified in Genesis via the Ten Utterances of God. What's happening over here in the ten plagues, each one of these ten plagues is uprooting, is defying one of the ten utterances of Genesis and replacing the ten utterances as the things that are governing the Jewish people are the Ten Commandments of the Torah. And the idea, this is one of the central ideas of Torah philosophy, is that when we have Torah, we are not subject to the original ten utterances of the laws of nature. Now, before we continue, I want to make a quick segue to the discussion of the ten plagues in general. So, of course, they're split into groups of three. You have the Tzach Adash Be'achav. We mentioned them on the Pesach Seder. The first three, the middle three, and then the last four. Some of the commentaries go three, 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 and one. They take the final plague, the plague of the firstborn, and put it in a category of, of its own. And these plagues, it's not random plagues that the Almighty forced upon the Egyptians. These are all fitting punishments, fitting tit for tat for the behavior of the Egyptians over their Jewish subjects. The Kliakar, he says that the first three plagues all began beneath the ground. They were all subterranean. And that showed that God has dominion over what's happening below us. The next three are at ground level. God's in control of what's around us. The final three are from above. And that's demonstrating to all that the Almighty is in control of the things that are above us as well. The Maharal is a different formulation. He says that each one of these three components destroyed an aspect of Egyptian and frankly, Jewish heresy. And he says that heresy is comprised of three components. Number one, there are those that argue that God doesn't exist. Number two, there are those that acknowledge that God does exist, but he doesn't oversee us. There's no divine providence. And finally, there's a third group of heretics who say God maybe does exist, has some oversight, but doesn't have absolute and total power. These Three components, these are different types of heresy, were shattered by the three groups of plagues. The first three shattered the falsehood, dispelled the notion that God doesn't exist. The next three demonstrated to all God's providence. And the third three showed that God is unmatched by any power. There's also a Rashi. Rashi tells us that the plagues arrive in the order of a siege. First, you cut off the water supply. Then you blow trumpets to keep the enemy awake, etc. Each one of these plagues are part of one collective battle, so to speak, the Almighty is waging against the Egyptians. And then we read about the fourth plague, this plague of the swarm of wild beasts. Hashem said to Moses, arise early in the morning, say to himself before Pharaoh, and he goes out to the water and say to him, send the people out. Again, there's the period of warning. If you don't, then I'm going to send a swarm of wild beasts to you, to your people, to your houses, to your servants. And on that day, I shall set apart the land of Goshen upon which my people stands. There shall be no swarm there, so that you will know that I am Hashem in the midst of the land. I shall make a distinction between my people and your people. Tomorrow, the sign will come about. So it's interesting, the first three plagues, even though the Talmud tells us that the Jewish people were not subject to these plagues, here we have in the actual text of the Torah that the Almighty tells Moses to go tell Pharaoh that this plague is not going to touch the Jewish people. Why only here does it say that God will do a wonderment, God will do a tremendous miracle to distinguish the Jewish people from the Egyptians? So the Ramban notes that these were roving animals. This was a mobile plague, whereas the first three were stationary, they were static, and therefore only here is it impressive the fact that the moving 
roving swarm of beasts did not tread into the territory of the Jewish people. This time, apparently, Pharaoh, he wants to give in. He tells Moses and Aaron, go, bring offerings to your God, but do it in the land. And Moses says, no, we're not going to do this festival of, of service to God in the land. We have to leave, we have to go for a three-day journey in the wilderness, and then we're going to be sacrificed to God as he will tell us. So Moses is insisting the Jewish people leave three days and we will be back. And the question we have to ask is, is this all a ruse? Is this all a trick? Let us get three days out and then we'll hightail out of there and never come back. What if Pharaoh indeed, obviously this is a counterfactual, but what if Pharaoh indeed did tell the Jewish people to go out and go for your three-day festival, would they have come back? So one of the commentaries says something very interesting. We know the Jewish people were destined to be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. As of this moment, they've only been there for 210 years. There really are supposed to be another 190 years left to go. Now, the Talmud tells us that they left after 210 years, but the enslavement of the Jewish people, it's technically beginning from the birth of Isaac, and the Exodus is exactly 400 years from the birth of Isaac. And therefore, it's still technically a fulfillment of the prophecy when we leave after 210 years, because that's 400 years to the date of the birth of Isaac. He was born on Pesach and Passover. 400 years later, exactly, the Jewish people leave. Okay, so it works out. But the commentaries say that had, obviously, this doesn't exist, this is all hypothetical, but had Pharaoh allowed the Jewish people to leave, they would have left for three days, and they would have been given the strength they would have recharged their batteries for the next 190 years of anticipated servitude. So there is this possibility, theoretically, counterfactual, of course, that had the Jewish people left for three days, they would have been given the strength needed to survive another 190 years of servitude. Of course, it didn't work out like that. They had to leave. And once they left, the prophecy can still be true because the clock is going to start earlier from the birth of Isaac. And when the Jewish people are set in motion, that's already when the clock starts ticking for the 400 years. So Pharaoh agreed to send the Jewish people, provided that the swarm of beasts ends, and indeed Moses goes and he prays. And the following day, the beasts leave. Rashi points out that they leave, they don't remain dead, because if they remain there and dead, the Egyptians could have benefited by selling their hides, and therefore they all left never to return but not also to be benefited from by the Egyptians. But of course, Pharaoh's intransigence, Pharaoh's stubbornness returned, and he did not release the Jewish people. Then we read up the fifth plague. The fifth plague is a plague of the epidemic pestilence. It's going to kill the animals, but not the Jewish animals. And even though no Jewish animal died, Pharaoh hardened his heart yet again. Then we read about the sixth plague, the plague of boils, Moses and Aaron fill their hands with soot. They throw it up in front of Pharaoh, in front of his people. And miraculously, a couple of handfuls of soot is able to cover the entire Egypt with dust that turns into boils and everyone's miserable. The the, the, the men, the people, the, the animals that survived the epidemic, only the animals that were in the field died in the fifth plague of the pestilence. And this time the necromancers couldn't even stand before Moses because of the boils and Hashem hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not heed them as Hashem had spoken. This is the first time by the sixth blade where things have gotten so bad for Pharaoh that had he been left his own devices, he would have sent the Jewish people, but God hardened his heart. Hashem spoke to Moses, arise early in the morning and say to yourself before Pharaoh, say to him, so said Hashem the God of the Hebrews, Send out my people that may serve me for this time. And this is the seventh and final plague of our parsha. I'm going to send all my plagues against your heart, upon your servants, upon your people, so that you should know that there's none like me in this world. What does it mean that God is sending all of his plagues upon Pharaoh and upon his people? So Rashi tells us this reference for the plague of the firstborn. The Sepharno, he says that the last four plagues, they lingered on and on and on. The first six plagues were terribly painful, lots of suffering for the Egyptians, but once they were over, their effects ended with them. Whereas the effects of the final four plagues, they lasted 
for many, many months and years after the plagues had finished. Continues Moses, you still tread upon my people, you don't send them out. Behold, at this time tomorrow, I shall rain a very heavy hail, such as there's never been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. And then Moses gives them advice. Now tell everyone, gather in your livestock, everything you have in the field, all the people, the animals that are found in the field, bring them into the house because otherwise they'll be outside and the hail will descend upon them and they shall die. And then the verse tells us that the reaction to that was split. Some of the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of God, they chased their servants, the livestock, into the homes. And those who did not take the word of God to heart, they left out their servants, their livestock in the field, and they were blasted by this hail that we read about, a hail, an unprecedented hail. There was hail and fire Ice and fire together, flame image the hail, very heavy, such as never been in the land of Egypt from the time it came a nation. The hail struck on the entire land of Egypt. Everything that was in the field from man to beast, all the grass of the field, the hail struck. Every tree in the field was smashed. Only the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel lived, there was no hail. So the commentaries point out a few interesting things here. First of all, the Servants of Pharaoh are broken down into two groups. You have those who are fearful of the word of God, and they're the ones who brought in their property into their homes. And they have those who don't pay attention to the word of God. And the commentaries tell us that what does it mean to be fearful of God? We know the Ram tells us that our relationship with God falls into two categories. We have the love of God and we have the fear of God. What does that mean to be fearful of God? Here we find a definition. What it means to be fearful of God is to take God seriously, to pay attention. When you see the power of God, when you see the awesomeness of God, when you see these miracles happening, you act in a prudent fashion. Moses is telling you that there's going to be hail tomorrow. You look at the forecast, there's no hail. But you have paid attention hitherto and you bring your animals in. That is the definition of fear of God. Fear of God is not when someone's quaking in fear. The fear of God is someone who is noticing what's happening and living life according to that belief. There's also a very interesting Rashi here that describes what happened when Moses initiated the plague of hail. Hashem said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, and there's going to be hail upon the entire land of Egypt. Rashi quotes a Agadic Midrash telling us that God lifted Moses above the heavens, meaning that he ascended to a different dimension where the rules of nature don't apply. Here we have a very miraculous miracle, a plague, ice and fire mixing together, indicating the world has only one ruler. Both forces are united or coalesced. Are, both powers are, are subject to God. But bringing that to this world is only done when Moses, so to speak, is transcending to a different world, a world where those two don't even appear to be in conflict. My grandfather, blessed memory, he quoted Kabbalistically that there is one angel called Gabriel, Gabriel, and he is the master of the fire in heaven. And there's a second angel called Michael, Michael, if you will, and he's in charge of the water and the ice. And in heaven, they get along fine. It's only in this world that the ice and the fire do not coexist. Moses, he's ascending to a supernatural world. The period of the plagues is when the 10 utterances, so to speak, the 10 rules that govern our world are discarded temporarily and therefore ice and fire can coexist here as they do there. And as a result of this seventh plague, Pharaoh once again summoned Moses and Aaron and says to them, okay, I've sinned. Hashem is the righteous one. Me and my people, the wicked ones, please pray to God. Let the horrific thunder and hail stop. I'm going to send you away. You're not going to continue to remain. So Moses said to him, when I leave the city, I'm going to spread up my hands. I'm going to pray. Rashi tells us that in order for him to pray, he had to leave the city. The city was replete with idols, not an appropriate place for him to pray. And Moses goes out from the city. He stretches out his hands. The thunder and the hail ceases, and the rain did not reach the earth. Pharaoh saw the rain, the hail, the thunder had ceased. He continued to sin. He made his heart stubborn, he and his servants. Pharaoh's heart became strong and did not send the children of Israel as Hashem had spoken through Moses. A very fascinating Rashi that tells us 
that when this plague stopped, there was still hail that was coming down. But once the Almighty gave the order for it to stop, it froze in place. It was suspended mid-air. And the Midrash tells us that in Joshua's battles with the Amorites, some of that hail that was suspended for 40 years, it fell down and aided Joshua to victory. The rest of that hail is going to drop in the future apocalyptic war of Gog and Magog. That's the final war before the Messiah. We still have an amazing thing for the Midrash here. We still have portions of this plague, of this hail of ice and fire. It's still there in heaven, waiting for the order to come and save the Jewish people once again. Thus concludes Parshas Vaera. We have seven miraculous, amazing plagues. Pharaoh is still stiff in his resistance and in his stubbornness, in his intransigence. And next week, Parshas Bo, his will and his posture is finally going to be broken. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby from Torch and the Torch Center. This is the Parsha Podcast. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you and speaking to you next week.